Um, it's my pleasure now we're going to kick off the next talk with Robert Brewer from Crunch.io. Um, the, the title of his talk is Crushing the Head of the Snake. I, I think he's going to get into a few uh, analogies that he's got baked into that. Um, kind of clever. Um, the, so Robert is the chief architect at Crunch.io where he works with, with brilliant statisticians and developers on analytics as a service. He's also the lead developer of Cherry Pi, a leading HTTP server and framework for Python. Um, I want to note too, the, 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 the first thing I heard Robert say as I walked up here was, will the clicker work with Linux? Um, so he's, <laughs> he's a developer's developer. I, I think this is going to be a fun talk, and I'll pass it off to Robert. Thank you. I have a mic. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Uh, I guess you could call me a developer's developer, but uh, I really want to talk to you guys today um, not as super geeky developers. Um, I hope this talk is useful to you if you are uh, what I think I see mostly at this conference, which is, you know, I'm, I'm a scientist or I'm a researcher or I'm a grad student or whatever, and I'm not a programmer. So, you know, uh, maybe you don't have a CS degree and, and, and haven't uh, encountered a lot of the common solutions for really common problems. So what I'm going to try and do is just give you a little introduction to uh, some of the ways to kind of tame Python um, because it is really powerful and it does a lot of good things for you out of the box, but you can still do really stupid things with it, uh, especially if you're used to coding in C or some other language. Um, you know, you really want to learn kind of some of the ins and outs of just Python itself. And then there's also some general um, programming uh, techniques that we're going to go over that are that can really help you um, get your work done better and faster, okay? So, let's get started. Um, one of the things I wanna uh, really talk to you about is, you know, the, the problems of big data are really unique, um, depending, no matter what you call big, you know, as uh, Birch was saying this today, there he is. <laughs> uh, you know, it's really that my memory is small, not that my data is big. So, you're gonna run into the same problems no matter what, um, and you could read, you know, reams and reams and stuff about how to make Python do what you want, but some of those things really apply to big data problems, you know, and all the stuff about natural language processing, maybe you're not doing that, you know, and all the stuff about, you know, uh, literate coding, well, maybe you're not doing that. So, so one of the big problems with big data, of course, is performance, right? So uh, what you need to be able to do with your code in Python is be able to figure out how to make it faster. So there's really two primary tools we use for that in the Python world. Um, the first one is Timeit, and this comes from Python. It's just built in, you don't have to import, I mean, you don't have to install anything. And Python comes with this Timeit module, and this is really good for answering the question, how long will my algorithm take, right? And so uh, Timeit gives you just a, a really basic timer class, and you pass it some arguments. And the first one here is, what's the code I want to time? That's the first string here where it says range A. And then the second argument is, what kind of setup do I need to do to get ready to, to run my code that I actually want to time? So that's just preparation. So what we're doing here is we're using Python's range function, which just makes a, a list, uh, uh, sequential. And uh, so our, our setup in this code here is we're gonna make, uh, we're gonna make a variable that says a million. And then what we want to time is how long does it take to make a list of that many items. So how long does it take to make a list of a million items in Python? Gonna be different on every machine. But in mine, if you run this once, it takes 28 milliseconds to make a million element list in Python out of this range function, right? And you can pass, you know, different, different amounts to time it. So you can see how when it's 100 or 1,000 times, it kind of scales up pretty line linearly, although not completely. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. And then uh, the default argument for time it is a million. So I, I really want to caution you if you're using time it, don't pass no arguments to it first. Always pass the one first, just in case what you're timing takes six days. You don't want to wait to find out how long that takes. So, so uh, do, do one first and then work your way up. But for now, we'll just we'll do it with you know, a million because we're doing really simple things here. So uh, what you can do with time it is say, well, I have, I have two ways I could write this. Which one's going to be faster, right? And that's the great thing about time it. So you could say, well, it takes me so long to, to make a 1,000-element list. 
I've heard about this cool thing called X range, which you know kind of iterates over this and gives me yields values to me rather than returning the whole thing. I, I've heard that's faster. Let's find out if it is. And so we we time that and see how much faster that goes. Oh, and it turns out that's a lot faster. So yeah, I want to use X range everywhere. And then you have to be a little subtle in your use of these tools because it's really easy to kind of misguide yourself with time it and say, hey, I just found something that's faster. I'm going to rewrite my whole code base and, and make that, you know, use that. Well, you have to be a little cautious because it turns out that it's, it's really fast to make this X range thing because it does almost nothing until you try to iterate over it. And then it makes, <laughs> then you start yielding these values, right? So when you actually do that with this list operator down here, list function, it turns out that Iterating over that list can actually take more time than if you just use the range function. But the point here is that time it is really a good way to compare functions one at a time. Uh, so one caveat with this is that time it uh, does have some overhead. And it's, it's uh, not going to give you the time of just what you want to run, but it, there's a little bit of overhead of, from the time it module itself. Okay. So this is how long it takes on my machine to do nothing a million times. It takes 29 milliseconds. So if you really are you know, benchmarking something on a production box, you want to find out how long it's going to take, you might have to subtract this out. Just something to be aware of. And then uh, finally, it's wall time, which means you know, how, how far has my minute hand moved on my, my clock on the wall, not how, how hard did my CPU work, which means if you, if you use time it and you start to time something and then you find out, oh, well, you know, somebody sent me an email and I'm going to go download this video and watch it, you know, while my timer's running, it's probably going to affect your times because it's going to use up CPU and other resources on your machine. So uh, what that means is that random things that are happening on your machine at the same time really affect the times here. So it's totally okay to run a time, time it loop you know, a few times and take the smallest number. That's the one that you want to go with to, to compare because maybe the first one here, which seemed to take a little bit longer, you know, maybe I was reading some email or something at the same time or, or something's happening in the background on my machine. So take the minimum and time it gives you this repeat function, which makes that really easy. So what this is saying is do this a million times and then do that three times and, and give, me the, give me the times of each of those runs. So that's, that's a great tool. And then you might say, well, OK, I'm, I'm actually I'm using time it, and I'm timing you know, my functions, different ways of doing this thing. And those are actually really complicated. And I want to know, well, why is this one slower than the other? Or, or what part of this is actually taking all the time? And for that, we need a little more sophisticated tool than time it. That's going to be the profile module in Python. Uh, what you should always do, almost all the time, is not import profile, but import C profile, <laughs> because it's a lot faster, has lower overhead. Just start with C profile, and you'll be happy. Okay. Um, but the basics of C profile, it's very easy to use. We're just going to import you know, my module, import C profile, and, and call this run method. And again, uh, the first argument here is, well, what am I actually going to profile? And, and so I'm calling some B function in my, in my mod module. That's what this is doing. And then I always recommend starting with this sort equals cumulative parameter. And I'll show you why in a minute, but it's just there so that you know that it's there. So the way this works is, you know, a lot of times is you're just developing one implementation of your logic. You, you run it. You see how long it takes. See, see where the bottlenecks are. Then you go back and you make changes to your code. Run it again. OK, did I improve? And you look at the outputs of both of these, and I'll show you that next. So when you do that, you have to reload your module in Python, or unless you're starting a new process. But if you're just doing this all in the interactive interpreter, you go and make changes to your code. Until you call this reload module function, you're not going to see the changes in your, in your current session. So always do the reloading, and then just run the, run the uh, profile module again and see what the output's like. So this is what the output's like. A lot of stuff there. Uh, and this is a really toy example, so there's even less lot of stuff there than usual. 
So here's what we're doing. I have a little more complex thing that I'm profiling right now. So we're just doing a for loop, and then we're making some lists, and then we're sorting the lists. So the, the second line there, you can see how many function calls total did this make, and how long did that take total, and then we see it's ordered by cumulative time. So just to quickly orient you to the output here, uh, if you haven't seen it before, I think it's backwards. I always like to start from, from the right-hand side here and say, well, what, what, what were the actual functions that were called, that were used in my uh, whatever I'm timing? And then the first thing I always like to look at is this cumulative time column, okay? And that's why I sorted it by cumulative time. Because this tells me, this column tells me how long did this function take and all of the functions that it calls to. That's what it means by cumulative, okay? So if you think of it like, you know, your code is an onion and you have a main function and then that calls some other functions and that calls other functions or a tree or something, the cumulative time gives you, well, what's the time of that and everything below it, right? Whereas total time tells you what was the time of that function without all of the stuff below it, okay? And then the per call columns just say, well, in this case, this first case, I only called the function one time. So my total time and my per call time are exactly the same. But the second one I called 3,000 times. And so each time it took less than the resolution of my timing here, <laughs> took less than one millisecond. But all together, those 3,000 took 52 milliseconds. Okay? And then it tells you some stuff here. So that's a little bit much. Um, so I'm going to take some of that stuff out. The first line here is actually not telling me anything useful about what I'm timing, except this whole string one module thing. That's, that's saying, how long did it take to actually get into the function? <laughs> so we don't usually care about that. And then this last one here, I don't know why this changed in some recent version of Python, where the profiler now includes itself. I think that's totally bogus. But maybe, maybe you think otherwise. So I'm just going to take a bunch of that stuff out. And we're going to look at a few of these as we go along. Yes, sir? Uh, it did, actually. And that was the uh, time, the time difference here between lines one and two. So you, there is 40 milliseconds of iterating over the X range. The reason it's not shown explicitly is because that's not a function call. That's inline code. And what we get here on each line is a separate function. So if we could, we could force it to be shown by kind of putting that in its own function, but we haven't done that. Yes? That's generally true uh, with, you know, some minor epsilon differences in, in adding the numbers together. So yes. So the total time generally should add up here. The thing is that some of these are nested and, and nested and nested. So it's, it's, it's a tree more than a linear uh, addition. So, so, for example, you can see here that, uh, well, I don't have much to show you with here. I'll show you later on some more about how that, how that nests together. So, whoops, wrong button. So I'm going to take out all the cruft and just show you the important parts, I hope. So uh, the way I'm going to kind of go about some of these techniques is really give you an extended example here, OK? And what we're going to do is we're going to do a standard deviation. So we have an array of numbers, a bunch of floats. And it's really easy. In Python, you just import NumPy, make an array of, of 100 numbers. I'm just going to use a, a range here because it's easy. You could, you could start with a static list of numbers. They're all floats. And so then I'm going to call NumPy. It's got a STD method on the uh, array class, tell it the degrees of freedom if you care, and then you get the answer. Really easy, right? So what could go wrong? <laughs> OK, so that worked out really well, and I timed that, and it was great. And now I say, OK, now I, I want to do a standard deviation on 4 billion rows. Oh, let me do that. Let me make my NumPy array. And, oops, something went wrong there. Hmm, value error setting, I don't understand that. I, I, the X range worked before. I don't see why it wouldn't work now. And it turns out, oh, let me try it with you know zeros instead of a range. Oh, well, I can't actually make a NumPy array that's 4 billion elements long. <laughs> so what do I do about that? I was using NumPy because it was magic, and it solved all my problems. And now I, I'm stuck, right? How do I get my standard deviation over this many numbers? 
Okay, so you have, to, you have to unpack the magic a little bit here. So what if we could take our big, long column of numbers and break it up into segments and figure out some math on those and then pull all that back together? Can I, can I distribute my standard deviation calculation? Because if I make those segments small enough, then I can just use NumPy arrays, right? Well, it turns out you can. Uh, so you, you grab the, uh, the local variance, you know, standard deviation is uh, variance from the mean squared and all that. If you, if you use the local mean and grab some of that data, then when you bring them all back together, you just kind of adjust that to the global mean and then finish your calculation. Yeah, there's all kinds of epsilon problems and stuff there, but for the moment, <laughs> assume this works, okay? But uh, this is a way to kind of distribute our problem and get around the memory error. That's what we're trying to solve, right? So we're gonna implement that in code. It's really easy. It's easier than writing it in the mathematical formula. So we're gonna have our, our main run method here. We're gonna, I'm actually gonna, as I do my timing, I'm gonna lop off four zeros here so that it doesn't take days to actually figure out how long this takes. <laughs> so we're actually gonna start with 400,000 points instead of four billion, but we're still gonna segment it. We're gonna make 100 segments. And then we're going to actually form these and then pass it all to our, our standard deviation function. This is what the standard deviation function looks like. We're just we're going to grab the local mean. We're going to find the global mean. We're going to do our adjustment and then put it all together, right? Pretty straightforward. And when we try that and we run our profile, it takes 71 seconds, which sounds really great. Right, okay, so I got my answer, except I loft off four zeros. And if I actually think about it and estimate, well, how long is this gonna take if I actually didn't lop off all those zeros and I have four billion elements, it's gonna take me over eight days to calculate the answer to this on my little laptop, <laughs> which is actually a pretty kick-butt laptop. So, I probably don't wanna wait eight days for the problem here. So, what do you do? Well, I can't just go download NumPy and have it fix all my problems, or pandas, what do I do? Well, now you need to learn a little bit of programming. Can we get this from eight days down to a minute? Okay, and if, that, if I do that, then that means that I need to be able to do the smaller toy one here of 400,000 in six milliseconds. Can I do that? All I need is a, you know, 11,000 times speed up. <laughs> Can we do it? Well, let's find out. So, what we want to do is optimize our code. Look at the code that, that we wrote that somebody else isn't you know, controlling. Can we improve it? Well, this is what profile is for. So if we look at the profile output, and we can identify some bottlenecks right away. So our first bottleneck here is actually, that really jumps out on us, is this total time. 63 seconds to run our, our total method in standard dev.py. Why is that taking so much time? And by the way, len there was taking a lot. Of, it wasn't, the len function is being called a lot and it, it just doesn't happen to be quite as long. So we're gonna, we're gonna investigate that too on the side. Let's see why. So the first thing I want you to be able to use you know, you learn this in year one of, of CS. If, you, if you're doing something in a loop and things in that loop don't change, then don't redo them every time you go through the loop, okay? So here's a great example. Here's, our, here's our, one of our helper functions that, that grabs all these variances from the local means, right? So we, we're just doing a really simple accumulator here. We look at every element in our array, calculate the mean of the array, and then we you know, subtract that from our, our value of each cell and do the square and all this. Adding that all up as we go. Uh, when we look at loop, when we talk about loop invariance, you might think, well, number one, that's about loops, right? So where's the loop in here? Got a for loop. What's the invariant? Well, first of all, you have to say, well, what is actually varying? And the thing that's varying in this loop is J. That's the thing that's varying. So if I have part of, if I have anything in my loop here that doesn't depend on J, maybe that's the problem. Maybe I should pull that out of my loop, okay? 
So of those two lines, which one depends on J? It's the bottom one. This one here doesn't depend on J at all. So what I'm basically doing here is I'm saying for every cell and every element in my array, do the same work all over again that I just did. Crazy. So let's pop that out of there and only do it once and just reuse the answer every time. Okay, but I gotta make sure that this actually helps. So I'm gonna go back and run my profiling time again. Look at that, one line of code change, we got a 36 time speed up. Okay, I'm trying to make this obvious for you, but sometimes it's not obvious. <laughs> so our time on the total function went from 61 seconds down to you know, 1.6 seconds. And you can see that we're calling it not 400,000 times, but 10,000 times. That's why we got the speed up, okay? And incidentally, we did the same thing with length. But I got this great speed up, but if I extrapolate that to my 4 billion array, it's still gonna be 5.4 hours, I, I can do better. So how, what, what do I do next? Well, let's go see if there's some other loop invariants we can pull out here. And here's one in the standard dev. I'm gonna highlight this one for you so it's easy. You know, here we are calculating the global mean. And we're doing that once for every part of, of our partition. So we have, if we have 100 segments, then I'm calculating this global mean 100 times. And not only that, I'm, I'm calculating it. I'm, I'm re-looping over these partitions multiple times inside of itself. So let's extract that loop invariant. Take that out of the for loop. How does that work? See if that improves our time. Hey, 13 by speed up. Okay, so really simple techniques that can get you a lot of boost. Uh, so you can see now that our verisum and our total method here are taking milliseconds, not multiple seconds. And we're doing much better, but we're still got, it's still 23 minutes. You know, maybe you might be happy with that. I think we can do better. So another classic technique, and this is really Python specific. <laughs> If you're in C, you know, you're going to be using whatever library you're using. In Python, code written in Python is slower than Python itself because most of Python itself is written in C, okay? So Python has to go through this extra interpretive loop. So this is something I, I see way too often, actually, where people who are used to JavaScript or C or some other language, they come into Python and they say, well, this is how I do it in C, you know, I want to accumulate this value, I want to walk over my, my values in my array and sum them up, so I'm just gonna have an accumulator that adds it all together. Which, again, great, do that in C and JavaScript. But Python provides a sum function which does that for you, and it does it for you in C, and it's been heavily tuned by Tim Peters and Raymond Hedinger and those guys who know far more than I do about how to tune that, right? So this is like, you know, uh, you're not going to get any faster than this. You could spend days and days and days trying to write a faster algorithm in Python. You're never going to get there. So use Python built-ins when you can because now our total function is just dropped off the chart. It's not 63 milliseconds anymore. It's zero, <laughs> which is as good as we can get with these tools, right? So uh, you can see that some of it has been taken up though by this sum function. So the cumulative time, again here, this is a great example of the nesting. The, uh, the total function is still cumulatively taking 15 milliseconds, but all of that is spent just calling sum and then you return the value. So it effectively does nothing. But we're still taking 16 minutes. What do we identify next? Can we get faster? Why yes, let's look at our profile output again here. What leaps out? That's the slowest over there, it's this verisum. What can we do about that? That's still kicking us. Well, huh, let's try the same technique here. Let's see if we can replace that accumulator with a sum. And let's be kind of clever about it. Uh, some of you may have been to James Powell's talk about generators. So we're gonna use a generator expression. They're really, they're really cool. Uh, we're gonna sum that, right? Makes our code easier to read. Let's run that and see if our, uh-oh. Uh we actually got slower when we used the Python built-ins. What happened? Well, if you look at this output a little bit, you start to say, well, what's this 
thing that's really slow that's being called 400,000 times Gen X per, uh, what is that? <sighs> this is where Python bites us in the heel sometimes, okay? And what you really want to do with Python is if you can write your code in line and not call functions, you really want to write your code in line because function call overhead in Python is unfortunately too high. Here's, here's an example. So if we're, just, uh, if we're just timing the sum function, Python's built-in sum function, right? And we run that a few times. It takes about 15, 14, 15 milliseconds to you know, sum a, a list of 10 items a million times. Now if I just take that exact same function and I wrap it in my total function instead, so all I'm adding is a call within a call, right? then it takes 20, 21 milliseconds. Sorry, 200, <laughs> as opposed to 150. Sorry, I misspoke there. Basically, what we're adding here, when you unpack all this, is it looks like a small amount. We're only adding, uh, what is that? I don't know, 59, huh? 59, I can't even remember my orders here. Nanoseconds? Yeah, per call. But the problem is we're calling this 400,000 times and so that adds up. All these things add up, and that's kind of the point of any optimization work is to reduce those things that add up. So simply the, the function call overhead of calling total, which then calls sum, and then returns it, is doing this to us. And the way that, the way that happens is, the reason that's so expensive, when you're, in, you're running your code and you call out to a function, then Python has to take your current context and store it and then set up this new context for the other function. And you're got it, it's got its own local variables and its own state and its own instruction pointer and whatever else. And then when you return from that function, it throws that away and re-instantiates, you know, pulls back your previous context and puts it back into place, right? Yes, sir? So you really don't like cursive functions? Not in Python. <laughs> I do in C. <laughs> you don't want to do recursion in Python, right, if you can avoid it. So you have this, this context switching you know, going on all the time when you call a function. Well, it turns out, back in the day before we had generator expressions in Python, you might have written a generator function instead. And so this, this does exactly what our other code did, only it kind of unpacks it with the, an explicit yield statement here. And the problem with this is whenever you yield in inside of a function, you're doing exactly that same context switch management. It's just like you're calling an external function, right? And so every time you yield from this function, the context switches again, which is why it showed up in our profile output as I did this 400,000 times, right? Because I did 400,000 context switches. Those are really expensive in Python, so we don't want to do that. So how do we fix that? Well, what we can do very easily is replace our generator expression up top with a list comprehension down below. All we have to do is add those little square brackets, okay? And that means that now my code is not gonna run on this context switching yield return, you know, call, call the generator yield the value thing. It's all gonna be inline code. So it's not even gonna show up in our output. And it's gonna be a lot faster. Now there are some memory implications here. Again, look at, you know, James Powell's talk to, to learn about those. But if you can do this, it's going to be faster where you need to do this. So now our verisum function has gone down to 50 milliseconds when it was 63. So that's, that's, that's kind of an improvement. So we got, we got kind of faster. We're still at 13 minutes. What's next? Okay, now you break out the heavy duty stuff and you say, okay, well, Python by itself, I don't want to have to iterate all those things because when it, yes, sir. Uh, that would have been the same kind of issue where whether you're using reduce or map or any of those uh, folding operations, you, you pay that function call overhead every time you, you go through that loop. Every, every item then has to go through that. Um, so let's try, let's try another tack here, see if we can get any faster. Let's use NumPy. Okay, the great thing about NumPy is you don't have to do a lot of rewriting to get some benefits. So all we're going to do is replace our total function. Instead of calling sum array, we're going to call array.sum. And similarly, array.mean down here, okay? And it's got some vector operations that make things really fast. 
You can learn about that somewhere else. It's really cool stuff. Type containers are faster. And great. So we got our, our uh, Versum from 50 whatever sec milliseconds down to one millisecond just by dropping in some NumPy. Fantastic. Got a 1.43 speed up there, but we're still at nine and a half minutes. What else can I do? Remember, I want to get this down under a minute. Whoops. Well, the interesting thing here is our profiling output really changed here. And before, it seemed like it took almost no time to make our arrays, and all the time was spent in analyzing our arrays. But now it looks like most of our time is actually in this NumPy array constructor. So we just, we did get a little faster, but not as much as we expected to. Because if you look at that, and if you take out the actual NumPy array construction times, we actually got to our six millisecond target. And we should be able to do this in one minute, right? So what happened? Well, we spent all our time making those NumPy arrays. So just for fun, let's take where we are right now. And let's try four billion of these things. See if it, you know, we, if, we, if we hit our six millisecond target, you know, let's see how long this takes. Oh yeah, <laughs> we can't just bump it up like that. We can't make a four billion element NumPy array. So now we have to actually do our segmentation properly and we're, we're actually gonna take the, the opportunity at the same time to parallelize it so we have multiple cores working on the same problem, okay? That's, the basics of that are really easy in Python. There's lots more advanced strategies you can get on to you know, farm this out to multiple machines. I'm just gonna show you the multiprocessing module, which does it on one machine, so at least you can take advantage of multiple cores. Because Python has this thing called the global interpreter lock, which means, yeah, you might think you have threads, but you don't really have threads, okay? So you gotta run it on multiple, pro multiple processes. So all we have to do is drop in this pool thing, which actually, when I construct the pool here, it actually goes and and it knows how many cores I'm running. <laughs> so it knows how many workers to start up here. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell it to run this run one function and then you know, parse out all my pieces and then bring it all back together, kind of a map reduce style here. So this is what the run one function looks like. We're actually gonna take advantage of some memory mapping uh, to get this off disk a little bit faster, we hope. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna change what I'm returning a little bit from each of the pieces. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna get back the, the total and the length so then I can calculate the local mean. And then I'm gonna return this V variable here which is the, the local variance, right? And then we're gonna go do our adjustments once we reduce it all. And then our, our standard deviation function looks pretty much the same. We're just gonna unpack the data a little bit differently. We're still doing exactly the same adjustments here. Put it all back together. Oh. That didn't work out too well. This is actually six times slower. Why is that? Well, it turns out that the multiprocessing module has some overhead, of course, to ship the commands out to each of the workers and to gather them all back. And you know, it ships the command out and then it sits there and waits for the, the response to come back and puts it all back together. So this is actually slower than, than what I had before. But I wonder if you know, looking at the, the actual functions there that are slow, well, it's threading.py and it's pool.py map and it's this thread lock acquire stuff and it seems to be all waiting for the workers. So maybe that's not gonna get much worse when I scale up. Maybe that's a little bit of noise when I actually get to four billion items. So, hey, could it be insignificant? Let's try it. it actually is rather insignificant. And we went from, I don't remember where we were at before, but we were at, you know, more than this. Um, and we're now really, really close to getting this done on four billion elements in under a minute, okay? But there's still a couple things here. Uh, it turns out that uh, using profile now got harder because I'm running these workers that are being spawned by, by Python and they're running in remote processes. So I have to be a little bit more careful now about profiling because back here I was just profiling the head node. Now how do I profile each of my workers? Well, I can't just do it interactively. So I have to, uh, I have to take a couple other little tools here that the profile module offers and actually dump my results to a file. So that's what that prf.50 thing is. 
So I'm going to dump the stats to a file, and then unfortunately it's a little bit harder. Uh, I have to be a little bit more mechanical about reading that file and sorting it and getting my results. But so that's what I did. I just took I took one of the hundred workers and I profiled just one of them, and I said, okay, well, what's this one doing? And it turns out that it's doing a lot of work in some for some reason. It's taking two seconds in this ufunc reduce thing. Well, that's weird. Uh, why would the sum function be so slow? Well, it turns out that it's slow because we're doing the memory mapping. So when you call that memmap function there, it does very little work just to set up some pointers to your data on disk. It doesn't actually read all that into RAM at that point. It's not until I call the sum function that it says, oh, now I need this data, let me pull it all into RAM. And that's why sum is taking so long there. And it's taking you know, a couple seconds each, which means over 100 segments, it's taking 200 seconds. But I have four cores, so it's actually 50 seconds you know, for each one of these. That's the, that's the total damage done by this approach. And if you look at it, yeah, I'm taking 67 whatever seconds, but 50 of those are just loading my data. right? So I, I've gone from a paralleliza parallelization problem now I've got a serialization problem. And if I could get rid of that somehow, then I could actually do the math, the actual math I'm interested in much more quickly. Right? So let's just throw in something. I heard once that BLOSK was really, it was faster than NumPy's native serialization format. So let me throw that in there, try it, does some compression. That's what that C-level thing is. So we're just gonna, we're gonna change how we save and, and, and load these files off a of disk. Let's see if that does any better. Well, let's try it. Yes, it does do better. And in fact, it does phenomenally better. Now we were shooting for a minute, you know, to get our, our total done here. And this is over the 4 billion element array, you know. We were shooting for a minute, and we got down to 26 seconds. And you can see here, you know, that the, the calls in the head have not changed because we're, we're showing you the head note here, but the total time definitely has. So we've just done... Uh, we've achieved our goal, right? So, how do we do that? Just to recap. Well, we had some time-tested general program techniques. So we, we took our loop invariants out, right? We used some language built-ins like sum and so on, and we, we really tried to reduce our Python function calls. Call C all you want. Reduce your Python function calls. And we used some specific you know, Python libraries to kind of drop in and make everything faster. So we used NumPy, for vector operations, which are always going to be faster. Um, we use multiprocessing for parallelization, and we use this BLOSK pack for compression. So we sped up our calculation. So it runs in not 3%, 0.003% of the time. <laughs> it's 27,000 times faster than when we started. OK? So when you really want to uh, go beyond the boundaries of what Python gives you out of the box, or even NumPy or SciPy or these other pandas or whatever give you out of the box, you're kind of in the wild west of some things. But you know, if you just learn a few techniques like this to make your code faster, and this also applies to, you know, hey, I'm using NumPy and all these things, but I have to write my own management software for all that stuff. Well, that needs to be kind of fast sometimes too. You know, that can be your bottleneck. So this really applies, you know, across the board. Make your make your uh, your code run faster, you know, if you, if you want your code to run in eight days, more power to you. <laughs> Maybe that gives you job security, but I want mine to run in whatever that was, 26 seconds, okay? Any questions? Yes, Brad. So about three fourths of the way through, I sort of went, yeah, that, that looks good, you know, you use the built-ins, reduce the function call, take out the loop endurance. But as you started to get to the end, it looked harder. biographical account of, of how, what your experience was, or you really stumped at each stage. And those last really hard optimizations, uh, uh, you know, how can I be confident if I go down this route of, I won't just end up at, uh, you know, 20 minutes, which wasn't close enough to uh, getting down to one minute? Okay, so that was, uh, that was a big question. Uh, so. Um, was this my personal experience um, not for this particular problem because we solved different pieces of it at different times so when I got to this particular problem um, we already had 90% of that solved <laughs> so so this is you know it, I actually had a hard time making this be slow enough because I'm so used to making it fast <laughs> so that was kind of a fun exercise how can I make this slower 
Um, but then, um, you know, it, I found that um, it's really a different story when, you know, when you're talking about the general programming techniques, which really are universal, um, versus, hey, I dropped in this library and it made it a lot faster. So uh, generally, I, I kind of like to think of that as, I mean, there's really two different mindsets of how can I, how can I make my stuff better versus how can I grab somebody else's stuff and use it quickly? You know, it's kind of the integrator mindset. Yes. Okay, wait for the mic. So <clears throat> sort of two questions that are related. First was for the multiprocessing part. Um, uh -huh. I'm assuming that you guys have experimented with other things like 0MQ, and I'm assuming they're faster, but do they work with C profile? Like, are you able to profile the different calls, the parallel calls to 0MQ the way you did with multiprocessing pool? Uh, right, yes. And in, in fact, at my current company, we are using 0MQ, um, and we do, we are able to do exactly the same profiling techniques. Um, the one thing you have to be a little bit careful about is if, uh, just like it was harder to profile a remote process that gets spawned automatically, um, you have to do a little extra work there. With things like 0MQ and other stuff, that starts threads that you don't know about and, and other things, and, and those are a little bit harder to profile. Um, you, have to, you have to know when to attach your profiler, which is pretty early. Yeah, Harder to do on an ad hoc basis. Any other questions? Oh. Simple old school question. Uh, when you're computing the variances, you did a subtraction followed by a square. Um, I actually haven't played with this in Python. Would it have been faster to um, basically multiply that, um, that subtracted amount times each other versus doing the, doing the square operation? Uh, it may have been. I actually I, didn't time that. Yeah, it, to do x times x rather than yeah. x squared. Uh, that may be, and that'd be a great thing to, to time it, time with time it or C profile. I actually, I kind of worked around that problem by just saying, well, I'm going to go back to NumPy eventually, <laughs> you know. So it's going to do it a heck of a lot faster than anything I can do in Python iteratively in a for loop. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time. Hope it was useful.